Thanks, thanks, Pablo. Like uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to all of you for coming. And to I know it's the evening time, and uh, you know all the after day of lectures and everything. So I appreciate your coming here. And uh, what I will do is I will take you through a journey. Actually, first the question is uh, before I tell you about a fossil fuel deprived world, I think it is a good idea. It's it's on. Like uh, can you all hear me? Like uh, okay, like a little bit. Is it? Is it really on? It's on? OK. All right. So, so what I will be talking to you about is uh, you know, why, why fossil fuel deprived world, right? So what I will start with is some, some quick energy facts okay, before I go deeper into why, why this talk. And uh, so the first, let's start with some energy facts. Okay? And it will be very short because uh, within an hour, I want to finish my lecture. So what I will do is I will just give you one slide, which probably most of you might have seen it. But, so just bear with me. And, we can talk for an hour just on this slide, okay? So, but I will try to finish in five minutes. And what this slide shows is all the energy sources here, and uh, like from petroleum all the way to hydro. And on this side, it shows how much is it is used in what sectors. For example, the residential would be like our houses, commercial would be like Walmarts and so forth, and the industrial would be like manufacturing sites, and light duty vehicles would be our cars, which we drive, and, and also all the transportation is here. And when we see on this side, it tells us like the total U.S. energy consumption in 2005. And all these numbers are in quadrillion BTUs. Okay? And what is a quadrillion? A quadrillion is 10 to the power 15 BTUs, British thermal unit, right? For some of us, what is BTU? Okay? A, a BTU is 1.05 kilowatt hours. Okay? So you can think of it as roughly give and take some within the engineering approximation as 
100 quadrillion kilowatt hours. Okay? And if we take it as 100, then all these numbers are percentages. Fair? Okay? And uh, so that's the rough, rough, rough thing which you'll find. And a couple of things to note, which is what I would like to bring your attention, uh, is that first of all, if you look at this is roughly 100, and how much is used and how much is simply goes to the atmosphere as heat. Okay? So the first thing is which we realize is that 55% of roughly the energy we use is because of the inefficiencies simply disappears. Okay? So when we talk about the energy picture, we talk about a lot of stuff, but energy efficiency is very, very important. Okay? All said and done at the end of the day. Okay? And then the other, other thing which I would like to bring to your attention is uh, if you see all this petroleum, natural gas, and coal, they are 85% of the total energy, okay? And that 85% of the total energy basically means 1.6, roughly, gigatons of carbon a year out of 7, 7.5, which is released, we release it because of that fossil fuel. So it is a substantial portion. It has very strong environmental footprint, okay? And the other thing which I would like you to bring to your attention is that out of this petroleum, which is 40%, roughly 60, 60, uh, 66 to 70% goes in just the transportation sector. So transportation sector alone can basically lends up putting out of the order of 0.5 gigatons of carbon a year in the atmosphere. So it has a very strong carbon footprint. Okay. And when I was putting this talk together, and because of the likes of Steve Pakala here and, and, and uh, Ralph Sokolo and all, I decided to stay away from the carbon. Okay. And, uh, but that doesn't mean, that does not mean by any means that it is less important in the talk, okay? Because everything interacts with the environment, and the, and just because Princeton has a lot of work on, on the carbon release, and it's what happens to CO2. So I will, if you want to, most of you, I'm sure, being on the campus, you know it. And if not, I would recommend you highly to read their Science 2004 article on the wedges. And and Rob just gave a talk at New York, uh, a, a New York Commission of something, and and that. That talk is an outstanding talk, by the way, so if you, if you want to see that. So having said that, that's my introduction to the environment, and, uh, and I will keep the environment out from going out from here. But keep in mind, energy and environment, they are tightly together, and, uh, and so whatever I say is governed by that. So, but in any event, so I just wanted to tell you 85% of the fossil energy, and, uh, and, and it leads to quite a bit of carbon release. So the question is, do we have enough fossil fuel, and how long will it last, and so forth, especially the younger audience in the in the bank, actually. So what you can, one can do is very quickly do some of the calculations for the US reserves to production ratio. And what is the reserve to production ratio? Reserves is basically, for example, in this case, it is all about oil, OK? And uh, for oil, for example, if you take it, the reserve is what oil in the United States we can recover economically, OK, with today's economics. So we know how much it is. If I know production per year, and if I divide reserve by production, I know how many years it is going to last, OK? And so, so you can see that oil is around 12, natural gas is around 11 years. Coal, of course, we have quite a bit. And this is with the current production rate, not current consumption rate. So keep that, that difference in mind, OK? And for the world, of course, if you look at the world as a whole, OK, as a planet or mothership, like, you know, what you find is there's enough oil and natural gas for the last, last for the next, you know, 40, 50 years with the current consumption rate. Because when we look at the world, production and consumption, they are... They are same, certainly. Okay? And uh, so the question is, there is enough to last for the next 50 years. So why am I here to talk about the fossil fuel-deprived world? Right? So it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. right? And uh, so what, uh, what reason we, we talk about that is not because of any other reasons, because uh, the, the catch is that, uh, in, in nutshell, the population of the world is rising. And uh, by 2050, it will be 10 billion people by various accounts. And, uh, with that rate of consumption of energy, it will won't be the current production and consumption rates. And uh, needless to say, the, China is building roughly two 500 megawatts plants using coal every week. And uh, with that rate of uh, energy escalation, it is interesting if you were to look at the Japan's growth rate in the 50s and 60s and 70s and project it for China. The, like in by 2050, China's energy consumption would out, would exceed that of us, uh, us, United States. Okay, and and that's pretty pretty scary scenario in that sense. And uh, and there's a lot of debate about the oil peaking and so forth. But I can tell you that it may not have may or may not happen in my lifetime. But all these young population, you know, all these new students, it will definitely happen in your lifetime. You can be certain about it. So it, it is it is an important issue. And of course, we as a nation. 
It is an energy independence and security issue. And uh, all said and done, it's going to take a long time to build a new energy source. And if you put an environmental responsiveness and urgency on this, it is really, really urgent to, for us to come up with a solution because it takes a long time to build alternate energy solution. It's not something you can do overnight. And I tell you what, one of the examples which I would like to, personal examples I would like to share is, uh, is the, when I came to the United States first time, and as the plane was landing at Kennedy Airport, being an immigrant coming from India, which had just become free, and when I saw out of the window that plane, the lighted city downstairs, you know, underneath, very lighted, I told myself, wow, so much light, can a city be so bright? And what I had not realized was, even for the United States, it had taken 70 plus years to electrify itself, okay? It was not something which happened rapidly. So keep that in mind. These things take long time. And, and also, when we talk about 100 quadrillion BTUs, how big is that number, right? Okay, so when you're sitting in the audience telling yourself, some of you, I don't know, if you're like me, you are probably lost, okay? What is, I can't fathom 100 quadrillion BTUs, okay, all right? And to me, there's a number which I just have no clue, okay? So what did I do as an engineer? What's, what's the thing I do? I take 100 quadrillion BTU, and I tell myself, okay, pretend all that energy comes from oil, okay? And if all that energy comes from oil, I know how much oil that would be, okay? I know we are 300 million people, and I can divide by 300 million, okay? And I can say, how many gallons of oil do I consume on a daily basis? That number I can connect to. And by the way, that's true for all of us. Each morning when we go, to, go up, get up, okay, and before we get up next morning, we would have consumed seven and a half gallons of oil on an average in the United States. Okay, that's what 100 quadrillion BTU means, okay? I assure you, very few of us would drink seven and a half gallons of milk every day, okay? All right, and yet on an average, that's the consumption we have, and that's what 100. So when we talk about a grand challenge of our time, the task, the scale of the task is very big. It's humongous, okay? So unless until we come up with a solution today, it's or start working on it, so by the time it is needed, so we can't wait for the fossil fuel to run out, okay? So that's the message I wanted to bring, okay? So, so what are the things? So we look at the alternate energy sources, okay? And, uh, and when we look at alternate energy sources, you go through the list, and you can add more things to this list, actually. And I, being at Purdue, sorry, at Princeton, I should have added fusion, nuclear fusion. It's, it's my mistake, okay? How can you come to this campus and not talk about that ultimate holy grail, right? Okay. So, so add that to the list, okay? And so the question is, when you go through all this, like nuclear and solar are the only ones that can alone meet our energy need for any foreseeable future, okay? Going forward in this talk, I will only talk about solar, okay? And uh, shows my biases and shows my lack of experience with nuclear. I, I do not know anything about that subject. But I will tell you, whatever I will be talking about, you could very easily put nuclear in there and it would be valid, okay? So with that caveat, I will leave the nuclear behind, okay? And so the question is, okay, the solar can meet, and here's the example which, uh, like, you know, you can sit down, it's very easy calculation. It's 100 quadrillion. Okay, and you can do the calculation. And by the way, if you took 100 quadrillion and you looked for the primary energy consumption, that's not the right calculation, right? Because if you're making electricity from solar directly, so you're not burning coal with 35% efficiency to make electricity, right? So my primary energy there was coal, but I got electricity only 35%. But if I'm making one third of the total energy is used as electricity, I better off account for all that. So once you account for all that, the land area needed for the U.S. energy consumption is pretty small, okay? It's like something which you can do, anywhere between 1.5% to 1.7%. To so it is doable, okay? So it's with, and that too only with a 10% efficient solar cell. So I'm not asking for 20%, 30%, or the record of 42%, okay? So keep that. That's another thing to, to note, okay? So, so if it's so easy, why don't we do it, right, is, is the next question, okay? So why you come to Princeton, why Princeton's all... Is, is not running on, uh, or Purdue is not running on, um, on solar energy? And the answer is very simple, okay? The answer is, with today's economics, it does not make sense, okay? So if you were to make uh, an electricity from solar, okay, it is anywhere from 15 cents a kilowatt hours to 35 cents a kilowatt hour. And, uh, and just the economics doesn't work out, and obviously I'm not willing to pay 35 cents a kilowatt hour if I can buy it for 10 cents a kilowatt hour, okay? In Indiana which is most of the power plants are for coal. Coal electricity is very cheap because it's coal is the cheapest. As a matter of fact, coal is one energy source which, whose price hasn't changed in the last 40, 50 years, okay? 
and, uh, and it's a pretty stable price, and you can burn it, and you can produce it. So, so what are we going to do? So the question is, is at 15 cents with solar thermal, like the big plants, like 50 megawatts, 200 megawatts, and we have them operating in California and, and Nevada. You can set them up. And the solar cells are the ones which are 35, 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay? So, so, it, uh, so there is a solar thermal, and none of us talk about solar thermal somehow because for whatever reasons, we concentrate on solar cells because probably scientifically it is more attractive, I would think. And, but solar thermal is equally equ equally good candidate. Okay? And uh, so we need a low-cost methods, okay? and a uh, lot of work needs to be done here. And I just give a glimpse of it here. Like, you know, we need to make cheaper solar cells, not necessarily the most efficient ones. Okay? And uh, there's a lot of work which is coming in organic, inorganic hybrids, photoelectrochemical solar thermal. There's a whole slew of things. Storage is a big challenge in solar, the intermittency. Okay? And, uh, and when you talk about solar thermal, it allows us to, use, to store it as heat, not necessarily batteries as, as electricity. So it seems like when we think of, of energy storage, we always seem to think about batteries. And, uh, but that's where we can make some of the chemical engineers come into picture along with the chemists, like finding materials which can store large quantities of heat at higher temperatures. Okay? So the energy content is high. And what I would like to do is, at this point in time, I would like to share an example from my own lab, okay, about uh, making solar cells. Okay? And uh, what uh, I would like to show you is uh, what we have done so far in, 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 in a quick slide, actually. Here is a copper indium diacylanide, uh, uh, like nanocrystalline ink. The nanocrystals are of the size anywhere between 35 nanometers to 80 nanometers. And we, we prepare them. I will show you how we prepare them. So we prepare this nano ink. And uh, these are perfect crystals of chalcopyrite. You can look at high-resolution TM. It's perfect, absolutely, the dimensions and, and, the, and the lattice structure. Here are the other things. We can cast the film and anneal it, and we form nice, nice growth, as you would like for the chalcopyrite structures to grow if you want. A, these are one and a half micron thick films, OK? And uh, this is the finished device from the lab. And we can do everything in the lab, by the way. The lab which I have can go from beginning to the, to the end, actually. We do it even doing the measurements, IV curves, and everything, and characterizing it. And here is a one IV curve. And this one is 5.1% efficient. But as of, of uh, two weeks ago, we are around 56 to 5.7% efficient. And we are climbing in the efficiency. And it took me a long time, three years to come so far, like you know, coming from a classical chemical engineering refrigeration background to come with the solar cells. And what it takes to make a good solar cell was a very steep learning curve. But I do, I, but I do believe that this is the one of the solutions, the day we find a low cost. Something which can make cheap by chemical engineering principles or in a, in a reactor, shake it, just cast it, roll it through a, through a film, through an annealing chamber, and if you can get, and that's what we do, by the way. We make the ink, we put it, we drop cast it, we anneal it at 450 degrees Celsius, we take it out, we put another batch reactor, put the cat sulfide, we take it out. The last step is the only one we use at vacuum where we sputter the ITO on it. That's the only step. And everything is done in the hood. So there's no clean room. There's nothing at all. And still, we have got to this efficiency. So I, I, I think it is still a journey which is on the progress. Okay? And, um, and, and, by, and, and one thing which I would like to tell you, one lesson I have learned while working on the solar cells is that while chemical engineering is great, but it requires a lot of interdisciplinary knowledge. Okay? You, you got to know the solid state physics. You got to know solid state devices. So you've not got to know your electric and Electrical engineering, you've got to know your charge transport in the nano devices. You've got to know everything together. Only then and then you can hope to begin to, to produce a, a, a good solar cell. Okay? So it is not just simply just doing And I was a little bit naive when I was doing that. But as the time has passed by, I've learned that I had to go and acquire all that knowledge. Okay? And, um, and, uh, and we published our first paper in Nano Letters, actually. And uh, the, the, the paper we published that time, our efficiency was 3.0. Three point eight percent. So the paper, if you go and back and look at the paper, it is cost talks about three point eight percent efficient solar cells. And how do we make it? Simply, good old batch reactor. You put very simple ingredients in that, and and you just simply cook it at one atmosphere, two hundred eighty-five degrees Celsius, and we do get our ink. Okay, the nanocrystalline ink, which I showed you. It looks so simple, but trust me, it took us a year and a half to come to this point. Okay, we tried many, many recipes and and uh, you know and so forth. And what do we make? Okay, I just thought I would share with you some of the, uh, some of the images. Like uh, here is a 50 nanometer crystal. And by the way, adjusting the reaction conditions, we can create many, many shapes. Okay? 
It's kind of like, you know, for, as you can see from this shape to nano, nano disks to nano rings. The first time when I saw this, I absolutely flipped because it reminded me of high school where you make the benzene ring we used to draw with a hole in the center. How do you grow something like this? Okay. And, 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 and the catch is that these, these dimensions, the thickness of this is around two nanometers. Okay. So how does the density of states of these things look like? Okay. And there's a whole slew of things. How do you grow something which has a hole in the center? Okay. And uh, rather than following all that trail, which is what scientifically is very exciting to follow, I told my guys, said, we are on a mission right now. We've got to make the solar cell first. Okay. And so what we have done is we have put it on a sideline, but the day we hit 8 to 10%, we'll come back and see what nucleation and growth mechanisms would lead to such phenomenon, whereby you would form a hexagonal rings and, uh, of such nice dimensions, actually. And what special properties they may hold in terms of electronic properties it is worth pursuing, actually. And uh, so that's the, so in a nutshell, what I've told you so far, that energy is important. I hope the fossil fuels, because of the finiteness, the time rate at which we consume fossil fuel is different. And so we must come, and solar can provide a long-term viable solution. So I told you our attempt in the lab to make cheaper solar cells. But uh, it is just one of the attempts, and there are many, many across the country who are doing it. And sooner or later, I'm sure that someone is going to come up with the answer. OK, that's my belief, at least. OK, so what will the world look like in a fossil fuel deployed future, right? So, so let's go on a journey where we will just pretend that fossil fuels do not exist, OK? And if they do not exist, and we, for whatever reasons, you know, we, what would we do, OK, is, is the question. OK, so, so what would we do is, here is a solar economy. This is my vision, OK? So here is a solar economy. Okay, and what are our needs? What our needs are, of course, this shows my chemical engineering roots, right? Sun to chemicals is at the top, okay? But I tell you what, this is the most important, right? Sun to food, because as a human being, we would not survive if we did not have food. I don't know about you, but I would not drive, but I would eat my food first, okay? So, so it's very, very important, okay? So, so, so in any solar economy, we must be able to meet food, chemicals, heat, electricity, and the transportation. We must be able to meet all those needs. And so what does that mean? That means all the solar photons which fall, like you know, a kilowatt would be required, that power, we must be able to optimize it. Okay? And all these uses have to exist, coexist somehow. Okay? And they have to exist in a thermoeconomic terms. Okay? And so how do we go about doing that? So as an exercise, when I was doing this with my graduate student, the first question which I asked him was, was okay, so we have it. How do you begin to distribute the photons in different buckets? Okay, how do you go about harnessing the energy and do it, right? So here, here is a, so let's start by the conversion efficiency. So here is the same thing which I showed you, but in a more, uh, more, uh, more scientific manner, okay? So heat. I can recover heat anywhere between 60 to 80 percent efficiencies, okay? Depending on the temperatures, you can do very back of the envelope, black body radiation calculations, and uh, you can recover heat pretty, pretty, fairly high efficiencies, okay? And, uh, Electricity, 10% efficient solar cell, 15% efficient solar cell, so you can go and buy today. Okay? It's available in the market. Cost is the only constraint. Otherwise, you can definitely buy 10 to 15% efficient solar cells. Okay? And if you are making hydrogen, you could use electricity to electrolyze. You could use thermochemical methods, whatever you use. You can still get hydrogen 5 to 20% efficient. Okay? No problems. Okay? So, so these are doables. Okay? And, uh, and so the question is, is the next one is biomass. Okay, so what some of you already know the answer, but those who do not, let me just explain to you what we are talking here. Like uh, what we're talking about is, what's the efficiency from solar energy to biomass, for example? Here's my hand, right? And if in a year, I know how much light would fall if I were to expose it to sun outside, and I, I know how much biomass will grow in a year on this, on this hand, right? So at the end of the year, I go and harness the biomass, right? harvest the biomass. Once I have harvested the biomass, I know how much energy fell on my hand, there, and then I know how much energy is in the biomass. If I take the ratio of the two, I will know the efficiency from the solar energy to, to biomass, right? And all of you who do not know the answer, just think of a number in your mind, okay? And the answer is 0.3 to 1%, okay? It's the absolutely low efficiency of conversion from solar energy to biomass, okay? And uh, so, so the question is, is if you take this biomass and if you try to make the liquid fuel for transportation, okay, what you're going to find is 0.15 to 0.5 percent. Okay, so what is happening here is when you are allocating all those efficiencies, right? So this is what is the picture we got. So based on these numbers, right, from 60 to 80 percent, 10 to 45, it's very clear when we are looking for allocating 
how should I use the solar energy in a solar economy? A picture starts to emerge, right? Use the heat first, wherever I can, directly, okay? All right? When I can't use the heat first, let's go use electricity, okay? When I can't use electricity, maybe hydrogen, okay? Maybe, okay? Biomass liquid fuel becomes the last because we are allocating the photons, right? The land area. Uh, it directly translates into land area, okay? And uh, I wish the picture was this simple, okay? Because there is an intermittency storage problem. This is one of the pinch points of solar economy, by the way. Okay, anyone who is able to, to solve this, and we engineers can, by the way. I think, I, have, I happen to have a firm belief in, uh, you know, by nature and optimistic, you know, we can find solutions. That's what I believe. So and that's what I was told by Jimmy Ray, okay, when I worked for the master. Okay, that's what you learned. So that's what is, is still has stayed. So the catch is we can solve it. So the, what, what that means is that, and it's, as I said, the storage not only in terms of, of, of electricity, but think of storage in terms of heat at different temperatures and using it because that's what is the heel, Achilles heel here. And transmission to long distances and the cost. So those are the issues which we must address, okay? And uh, of all the uses which I showed you earlier, the chemicals, the, the heat, the electricity, and so forth, transportation is the most challenging. And that's what, uh, what Chris and I were discussing earlier, and Chris, and that's absolutely the fair point. That is the most challenging. So it's the high energy density fuel which we need, okay? And how are we gonna do that? And by transportation sector, I mean cars. And you will see the word light duty vehicles, and basically that means the cars you and I drive, okay? And the trucks, buses, trains, airplanes, and so forth. And the, the, the fuel which we use today has a very high energy density, 33 kilowatt hours per gallon of gasoline. And any, any one of you who has tried pushing the car 100 feet, okay, and the energy it has taken, and a gallon of that gasoline jug can take you 30, 30 miles, okay, you know how much energy is in there. And mind you that 30 miles in a gallon is with an engine which is only tw less than 20% efficient, okay? And if that engine was more efficient, there's a lot of, so when we talk about 33 kilowatt hours per gallon, it's a lot of energy, okay? I just, just want to just give you that mental picture of, of how, what we mean. And, and it has to be, of course, ease in terms of handling and in the, name, and the, in the hands of the common person. So, so if I need a high energy density fuel, in a solar economy, one of the ways of getting it is from that carbon biomass, right? Because uh, it is a condensed matter which Mother Nature has taken from 380 parts per million and given us, as a, because as a chemical engineer, if I have to go and recover that, that th think of a Maxwellian demon sitting, right? A million molecules buzzing by, and I have to grab, grab with my forceps 380 molecules. Pretty tough task, okay? And yet, environmental point of view, that's a very bad thing to happen and yet to go and recover that CO2 from the atmosphere would be absolutely challenging task, okay? And yet Mother Nature is doing exactly the same thing, is picking that and giving us as a condensed matter, okay? So what is it that we can do with that? Okay, so, so here is a very quick tour. Well, it's not that quick, but anyway, but uh, I'll take you through the next 20 minutes, 35 minutes, so through the energy systems of the U.S. transportation sector. What could it look like? So when I started work on this, like two years ago, like, you know, I basically asked my guest student, tell me how much biomass I need to support the, the U.S. transportation sector, okay? That was two summers ago, okay? We were just starting the journey, and, I, and he looked at me, and I looked at him. We did not know how to answer that question because we're not biologists, okay? I'm not, I have nothing biology background in my bones, okay? And all the conversions were done by bios, but I knew how to do traditional chemical engineering. So, so that's what we did. So how much area to support the U.S. transportation sector? And here's an answer. Take a biomass, dry it, gasify it do a water gas shift reaction, produce the feature troughs, make your liquid fuel. I know how to, how to model that, okay? Pretty simple, okay? And uh, we did that. U.S. Transport, transportation sector, 13.8 billion barrels a day, okay? That's what it needs, okay? And it doesn't take a couple of Aspen simulations, you know, a couple of assumptions, you have an answer. Why 25 to 55% of total U.S. land area? If you live on Purdue campus, you have agriculture, big agriculture department, you want to make sure that the biomass growth rate you have assumed, they are happy with that, right? So if I go to them, I say I've used uh, 10 tons per year per acre, and they say, no, no, they can grow at 25 tons per year per acre. You don't argue with them. You say, okay, fine, if you can, we'll put it in the model, okay? So that's the range, okay? So you see the lower range by, because of the higher biomass growth rate, which in my mind, okay, is not possible, okay? That's just my 
I, and I can say that because I'm not at Purdue campus right now. Okay, but uh, but the, but the truth is, is we need and just as an engineer, when I see such numbers, the question is, how big is 25 percent? How big is 55 percent? Right? That's the first question which you ask. Food we grow is roughly 20 to 25 percent of the U.S. land area. The pasture land is roughly the same magnitude. Okay, so really we don't have that kind of a land area to support the transportation sector. Okay, so that was very clear to us. Okay. So what, what should we do at that point in time? Okay, so, so the next question was, let's look at plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Okay, what is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle? A plug-in hybrid electric vehicle is not a, electric, a vehicle which has backup batteries which are charged with electricity okay, and can go short distances. So per charge of the battery, for example, you, for example, like if you look at me, my driving habits, right? I drive from home to my department, right? And uh, a round trip is 10 miles. And if I make two trips because I want to have a lunch with my wife on a given day, it's 20 miles, right, on a given day. So I don't drive more than 20 miles, okay? So majority of my drive, driving is 20 miles. If I'm coming to Princeton, I have to go to Indianapolis, okay, I need, need a backup to go 100 some odd miles, okay? So plug-in hybrid electric vehicles is you have a battery which gets charged, okay, and allows me to drive on my daily basis, okay? And when I go long distances, it has a gasoline which it uses, okay, or a diesel, whatever. So, so, if, so, so plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are very useful. As a matter of fact, I have driven one, okay, like uh, in Washington, D.C. Toyota brought one. Toyota has a model, which uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, which can go 12 miles per charge of the battery, and it runs perfectly well, okay? So I can tell you by my own driving, okay? And uh, so we, we picked a number like 40 miles per charge. So imagine 100, 200, 100 million cars out there, sun is shining, all of them are being charged, okay? If you did that, 5.5 million barrels out of that 13.8 million barrels I told you, okay, will not be needed, okay? Fair? Okay, so, so what will happen is we still need 8.3 million barrels per day, okay? So the question is, how are we going, going to get 8.3 million barrels, okay, sustainably from biomass? Can we do that was the next question. So trying to answer that question, what we did was, was uh, what I'm showing you here, like everyone reports in the, in the literature the energy as a, as a per kilogram basis, okay? So you look at switchgrass, poplar trees, sugar, and so forth, okay? It's all in megajoules per kilogram. And so, but, but engineering doesn't work on, on that basis. We need to look at per carbon atom basis. So when you look at per carbon basis, what you find is the energy content of gasoline is 604 kilojoules per kilomoles of carbon, switchgrass, and so forth, and so forth. And what does that mean? Why is that relevant? The reason that is relevant is when you look at it, what you realize is, is it will take three atoms of carbon to make two of gasoline, right? 450 times three, roughly 1,300, 600, 1,200, roughly, right? So, so even if I had a 100% efficient process, okay, conversion process, okay, there's no loss of energy, okay? I would still need, I would still lose in this case 33% of the carbon because I'm upgrading the energy content of the carbon atom, okay? And that carbon will go as a dead CO2 molecule in the atmosphere, okay? So what have I done? I took the biomass, which came with 0.3% efficiency, okay? And even if I did a 100% efficient conversion, I don't care what it is, okay? I would have lost one-third of the carbon to the atmosphere, right? And we as chemical engineers know that we can't have 100% efficient process. There's no way, okay? So, so assign some process efficiencies, whatever is the optimistic number, right? So I know a chemical process, methane reforming, 75% efficient, okay? So I said, okay, so I'll put 75%, and to make the biologists happy, 97% efficient for sugar conversion, okay? So, so you just put, so there's no, no debates, okay? Carbon loss, 50%, okay? So at the best scenario, I'm gonna recover only 50% of the carbon, okay? And the 50% of the carbon is back to the atmosphere with no fault of anyone, okay? So the question is, we got that carbon at such a high price, and now we are going to lose it, okay? How can we avoid doing that? So, so this is what, uh, Chris, you were talking about this figure. So, so the idea is, remember those efficiencies I showed you? The heat, which is 60 to 80% efficiency. Hydrogen, which was like 5 to 10, 15% efficiency. Why don't we combine? Why do we have to work in the compartments, right? We can combine the different energy sources together because our ultimate goal is to get the highest density fuel with the smallest possible land area, right? So let's combine the processes. So this, this basically is invoking that let's use heat, hydrogen, whatever it takes, which is recovered at a higher efficiency, and take with the biomass, where carbon is very precious, because it, my apologies for that, but uh, let's, uh, 
Okay, so, the, so where we were is how do we make 8.3 million barrels, and uh, what uh, I took you through all this, and we were talking about this, and uh, we said that, okay, we need a higher energy efficiency stuff with the solar photons and marry it with the carbon, the precious carbon we have as a biomass, and try to come up with a solution. So how are we going to do that is the next question, right? So it's basically a hydrogen and carbon economy together. So it's not pure hydrogen being used, but, but it's using carbon as a backbone for storing, storing hydrogen, okay? So there are many, many ways of doing it, by the, by the way. We can sit here and, and look at a large number of them, but what I will do is I will just carry you through two, okay? One is the gasification-based, another is, uh, is depolymerization followed by hydro-deoxygenation, okay? So, and, uh, so when we do that, what we did was we did some really quick, we did not do it in the same order, but, but I'm going to present you in this order, actually. It's a little bit of a cheating, but nevertheless. But what it was was the question which I had in mind was, which process will consume less hydrogen, okay? Whether the gasification or the depolymerization followed by hydrodeoxygenation. That was the basic question we were asking. And so if you take the, the, the building blocks of the biomass, like coniferal alcohol will be lignin, for example, xylose, C5, hemicellulose, okay? Glucose, part of the cellulose. So if you take all that and we ask ourselves, if you were to, each one of these, if you took, if we gasify it to CO and hydrogen, okay? and then reconstruct the molecule, okay? So how much hydrogen would I need, okay? The other alternative is taking the molecule, reacting it with hydrogen, and deoxygenating it, and making the molecules. In, one, in the later case, we retain the structure of the molecule, right? Because we're really not tearing it apart and rebuilding it. So what's the differences in the hydrogen consumption? And you find that the, this hydrodeoxygenation consumes nearly half of the, on an average, nearly half of the hydrogen than a gasification-based route would do, okay? So based on this insight, we said, okay, all right, what is it that we need to do? And, uh, and so here is the, here's, the, here's the paper which I had published originally based on the gasification, and this is the original process, and in the modified process, what I argued was that if you put the CO2 back in the gasifier, and if you were to put hydrogen from a carbon-free source, and there was a lot of modeling issues here, which I would not go for today's talk. We can do all that, and sorry, okay? And, uh, and by recycling the CO2, we've made sure that no CO2 is released and, and we'll get the final product. When you go through all those calculations, what you find is that the amount of the biomass required decreased substantially because every carbon atom is going to the liquid fuel, okay? That, and that has a directly direct hit on the land area. And since the hydrogen is made with an order of magnitude higher efficiency, the impact on the land area is very small, okay? So you can go do all those calculations and, and uh, indeed the land area is small, but the, the, I think, the biggest exciting news which we had that point in time was the fact that a DOE came with a billion ton biomass study. We in the country have a billion ton of biomass in a sustainable manner year after year. Okay? So the issue, and, and then the DOE went on to say that that billion ton of biomass will make one third of the transportation fuel. Okay? And when we did these studies, we found, boy, we need only 800 million tons and we can make and with a billion, 1.2 billion, you can make 13.8 million barrels a day. So you can meet the whole thing. So there was excitement. So that's what we published, okay? But, uh, yes, sure. Uh, the next question is, can I reduce the carbon dioxide in my cycle? And if so, how? No, I'm not, I'm just avoid the formation of the carbon dioxide. But the, you're right, so, so the way we, in the gasification we are, okay? And the, actually you, is, is it, okay? Yes, yeah, sure, okay. As, as okay. The, that is correct. Okay. Yeah. CO2 is reacting with hydrogen, okay, through reverse water gas shift, forming water and CO. Okay. And the reason it works is because we are at a high temperature, like thousand degrees Celsius in a gasifier. When you're at thousand degrees Celsius, it's a rough rule of thumb is when you run any, when we run gasifiers and reformers at thousand degrees Celsius, it is very close to thermodynamic equilibrium. And since water gas shift reaction is an exothermic reaction, at thousand degrees Celsius the reverse is preferred. Okay. And uh, and thereby, it is at equilibrium. And if we have put enough hydrogen to produce the syngas, that hydrogen will drive. So as, a, as you brought up a good point, I was just trying to avoid that issue, and my apologies for that. But the thing is, when we do this modeling calculation, this, a typical CO2 concentration in the output of a gasifier would be anywhere between 30 to 40%. Okay? Whereas in this process, when you do the modeling, the concentration of the CO2 in the output is less than 4%. And what that means is that all the pipes and sizes and the equipment which follow the gasifier would shrink in size, okay? 
And when you do a detailed model of the gasifier with all those free radical equations, okay, and the kinetics, okay, indeed they all go to the equilibrium. Okay, it's a very fast reaction. And uh, and in my old job, the way we used to calculate the temperature of the reformers and the gasifiers was by looking at the composition, and you subtract few delta. So that's a pretty good, pretty good rule of thumb. So that's how. But the trick is not to make that happen. That's the so once you put the hydrogen in, that's four percent CO two, but the rest of the CO two is never formed because it is whatever generally is made in the gasifier is all suppressed because of the presence of the hydrogen. Okay, all right. So, so that's the secret. So that's what we got. But then, what happened was it's capital intensive economics by nature. Fisher trust process gasifiers require to be very large in size. Okay, and. Uh, and, uh, and remember, I had already showed you that the hydrogen requirement is high. You can see that here, 0.33 kilograms of hydrogen <coughs> per liter. Of, this is pretty high hydrogen requirement, okay? And, and biomass is a very low energy density material, 17 megajoules per kilogram. Large quantities of biomass cannot be moved, okay? It's not like coal, it's not like oil. So what's the alternative process, right? So the alternative process has to be built on a small scale, has to be low cost, okay? Has to be high energy efficiency and should require less hydrogen. And I already told you what that could very well be. Okay, so here is the answer. You take a biomass, you take a carbon free source and what I call fast hydropyrolysis and hydro deoxygenation, okay? And this is where my PhD thesis came to my rescue. Okay? That knowledge which I had with hydro demetallation, hydro desulfurization, is not translating into hydro deoxygenation. Okay? So we do that, and we produce the byproducts, and we make the biofuel. And how could, and again, it is the same thing that we don't like to produce CO2 in the process. Okay? And uh, how could, and there are many ways of doing this, by the way. I'm just showing you a possible scheme of doing it. Okay? So don't get into the details. The bottom line is you take a biomass. You pass the hydrogen, you run your reaction around 500 degrees Celsius. That's the modeling, okay? We haven't done it. We are building the reactor in the lab right now to do it, okay? So I should let you know. We have not done it. It's all based on modeling, okay? We take it, run around 500 degrees Celsius with the residence time of less than a second or maybe a two seconds, okay? We come along, separate the solids, that's the charts, take all the light components, adjust the temperature in the neighborhood of 300 degrees Celsius. That's what at least I hope. We do a catalytic hydro de deoxygenation because now we can do that at a lower temperature. And then we go ahead, we condense, and we get our biofuel. Okay? And the light gases can be recycled back and so forth. So, so that's the modeling. That's the, what we model. Okay? And when you do that modeling, what you find out is, is once again, to make 8.3 million barrels, we need 0.97 billion tons of biomass. And now you know why I picked the number 40. Okay? Because I wanted to match that billion ton of biomass. Okay? So, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, 40 miles, intentionally picked because it reduced by the requirement. And so I just want to let you know. So that, there's a little bit of a gamesmanship here. But nevertheless, uh, the bottom line is that we can produce large quantities of, of oil with, and the advantage of this process is you can build it really small. Okay? And in a vision I have is you can build it on the back of a trailer, take it where you want to be, biomass, you do it, and then you move the plant somewhere else. Okay? So it, it doesn't exist at one place. Okay? And, uh, and of course, the, this slide shows you the carbon efficiency. So here is the H2Bio oil, that, that, that pyrolysis process I showed you, hydropyrolysis, 70% carbon efficiency, energy efficiency is around 82%. And this shows you the liquid fuel yield. Basically, what it is is since different processes make different kinds of oil, so you translate that all as if how many gallons that would be if they were all as ethanol. So it is ethanol gallon equivalent per ton of biomass. And it's fairly high, as you can see, compared to the conventional processes. Okay? And uh, so, so we have a process here. So we have a petrol, like uh, current state is petroleum crude, and this is what we are talking about, a, a solar economy, hydrogen from solar energy and biomass, an s 2 bio oil process. But currently, solar hydrogen is, uh, is uneconomical. So what we are doing is, is really, even though we can do fast hydropyrolysis, hopefully we can, that's, that's my hope at least, find the catalyst, and do the hydro deoxygenation, but if there is no cheap source of hydrogen, that means Lost case, okay? At least for the next 10, 15 years, okay? So what should we do? We need to look for the transitions. We, look to, we have to look for the intermediate solutions. And the way we look at it is, is there's no, nothing in the book which says that I have to use biomass alone, okay? All right? And in the transition, we, are, we have fossil fuels. How can we use fossil fuels synergistically with biomass? So how do we do? So I will just give you one example here. What, we, what the process which I envision here is we take a biomass. Remember that fast hydropyrolysis? Rather than hydrogen, I'm going to take a natural gas. Very simple, maybe this size, this size unit, a couple of tubes. I'm going to pass the natural gas with, with the steam, do the reforming, 
I will take the hot syngas from the reformer directly. No hydrogen production, no cooling, no separation, nothing, okay? I'm going to take the syngas directly, which is hydrogen CO, CO2 mixture, through this fast hydrophoralysis unit, which is 500 degrees Celsius. As the hydrogen is consumed, you can throw in the catalyst for water gas shift, reverse water gas shift. Again, as the hydrogen is consumed, CO will react with H2O. H2O is a byproduct of the reaction, and it will go back to the hydrogen. So it is all in situ done. You come along outside, you adjust the temperature again, you do your catalytic hydro deoxygenation, you condense this stuff, and the light gases which you get, you take a significant fraction here and burn it to provide the energy for reforming. Okay, so it's a very compact, what I envision is a very compact small unit which you would build. Okay, and uh, so when you're building such a small compact unit, is it worth building would be the next question. Okay, so we did modeling. Here's the modeling results. A billion ton of biomass, We'll need 198 billion cubic meters of natural gas to make 3.24 billion barrels of oil. That's what we need. That, that number I showed you, 8.3 million barrels per day, that, that's roughly that's what it translates into. If done separately, meaning if I took a billion ton of biomass and did by existing procedures by itself, with no need for any solar hydrogen or natural gas, I would make 1.19 billion barrels of oil. And if I took 198 billion cubic meters of natural gas, gas, if, gas to liquid, do a fissure troughs, reforming, I would make 0.79 billion barrels of oil. Total will be around 2 billion barrels of oil, and this process will make 3.24, because by retaining the structure of the biomass, taking the advantage of it, what Mother Nature has already done, there is a very synergistic process. You'll end up making 1.6 times more production by virtue of that, as against doing separately, okay? So there is a synergy in joining them together, can be built on the distributed scale, and if all this oil was to be produced by coal, Coal alone, the release decrease in the amount of carbon released is 0.72 gigatons of carbon, okay, a year. And because we are using natural gas, if we were to produce all this from petroleum crude versus this process, you will see a decrease of something like of the order of 0 0.2, 0 0.23 gigatons of carbon a year. So, so even in, while using natural gas, we'll see a substantial decrease in the release of the carbon while meeting that, that amount of oil, if the process is proved in the lab, which is what we are trying to do. And uh, exactly the same thing with coal, by the way, okay? You can exactly, the only problem with coal is that coal gasifiers, you can't build as small on the back and take it, okay? But, uh, but compared to coal, co-feeding biomass with coal or doing a coal gasification, this is definitely more synergistic. In the interest of time, I would not show you the answers, but, but if you are interested, I have the slides here. I will be very willing to, to show you the numbers after the, after the talk. Okay, so what, what am I trying to tell you? What I'm trying to tell you is that all this compartmentalization and all these solutions, looking at the solutions, is incorrect, okay? When we are looking for the transportation fuels, it has to, we have to look into the total context, okay? There's the electricity, which will drive it like a plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. There's the hydrogen, which will be needed to, to do the transformation. There's the biomass, which, which grows with the solar photons using atmospheric moisture and CO2 and water and so forth, which is the transportation, and maybe heat. Maybe not even hydrogen, okay? And that was the solar thermal thing we were talking about today. So there's a whole, we have to look at it in a very systems point of view and identify where we have the pinch points and where we go and make the answers, okay? That's the thing, but that's the, that's the only message I'm trying to bring from this talk, okay, by the way. Rather than looking at it in a individual compartments, we need to look at and identify where the pinch points are. Okay, so that's what I will do is in the next, next five minutes because, because the time has really run out is, is there's another part of my research, and that's the, remember I told you that 55% is the efficiency loss, right? And uh, so efficiency gain is very important. And uh, for us chemical engineers, uh, this is, this talk, just this part of the talk is very chemical, chemical engineering. Like, so, so multi-component separation has been one of my hobbies, actually, from, from my old job. And, uh, and it is one of the largest energy consumer in chemical plants, okay? So it's 40 to 70% of both capital and operating costs are because of, of separations in any given plant. And uh, there are 40,000 distillation columns in operation in the US and distillation consumes fairly large amount of energy, okay? And it's found in a variety of industries. And uh, one of the biggest challenges have been how to find what separation process to use when you have multi-component separation. So when I arrived at Purdue, this is one research which I decided to take on and uh, look for. And when I told my colleagues I'm going to do research in distillation and find multi-component separations, they all told, thought I was nuts because it's a mature technology. After all, we all know the answer. Why are you doing it was the question, okay? And, and my answer was I'm too dumb to know what is mature and what's not because as a practitioner, I had a tough time. I really had a tough time 
designing plants with four and five component separation. Okay, and so I told myself, I know I had a tough time. There has to be a better answer. Okay, so so that's what I did. Like uh, so. So we developed a method to draw and find optimal multi-component configurations. And what do I mean by configurations? Here is a four-component example for those of you who are not chemical engineers. It is basically arrangement of different distillation columns. Okay? And there's so many. And before our work, these were not even known. I should let you know. Okay? What I'm telling you today is what came out of our work. Okay? How many ways can you do it? Okay? Here are 24 ways you can do it. And six, there are 18 which make sense and six which do not. Okay? And I would not go in detail why. 18 are useful, 6 are not. And if you go here and exhaustive search, if you just let the computer lose, number of configurations, I just showed you 24 millions. And how do we narrow those these options? How do we find? Because most of them are non-plausible. Okay? They simply would not work. Okay? So how do you go and find the right one? We did that. Okay? We searched down our, we developed a method which really zones down on the right number of configurations. Okay? And, and the best thing is, no one had told us what 7 and 8, we can do it. We can do it 9, 10, whatever you need. Okay? I'm just putting 7 and 8 just to demonstrate to you that we can indeed do it. Okay? And then the next thing I did was I asked my graduate student, okay, so we have a program. We don't have a horsepower like Chris Fru does. So rather than using a mixed integer nonlinear program to solve the whole thing, since we knew each configuration, we said we are going to take that and run NLP on each one of them. And I told my guys, well, if it is worth the salt, try crude distillation, right? Because that's the largest energy consumer. We consume, uh, in the whole world, we, we distill 80 million barrels a day, and roughly 1.6 million barrels a day goes in this. Distillation configuration hasn't changed for 75 years, okay? So what is the right answer? Is that the right answer was the question. So we did that, and here's the 203 which I showed you. And without going into detail, I will just tell you that there are 6,128 more when we require thermal coupling and so forth, and here is the existing configuration. Just take it as out. So this was our search space. So we found the search space, okay? And next question is from that search space, can we find the ones which are better than what is today, right? We did that, and guess what? We found, for example, this is the existing one. This is what we found, and for the light feed, light petroleum feed is 16% efficient. For heavy petroleum feed, it is 8.3% efficient. By the way, there's seven more, okay? All right? They can be rank listed. And you think, and these are the retrofitable ones. What these can be retrofitted? And do you think this is the only answer? Absolutely not. If you start, decide to build a grassroots refineries, you could have savings 17 to 48 percent. Okay? Is this the only answer? Absolutely not. There's 62 more. Okay? So my guy's friend went in, he rank listed out of that 6,000 and odd numbers, all of them one by one by one. Here they are, and this is how much they can have a potential to save. Okay? And, uh, I'm just absolutely fascinated. Okay, I do not know about you. To me, as an industrial practitioner, this was one of the most important problems I had, which I needed to solve. Okay, and uh, I must tell you that Cavallaro and Grossman have been solving the same problem in parallel. They just published a paper before we could submit our paper. So that's always as a, a little bit, but the methods are different. So, so we are happy. Okay, at least it is not the same method. We had it. They can't do it for seven and eight. Okay, they can do only up to six. So, as long as methods are different and. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that, okay? And uh, so just to give you how big is 10% saving in a crude distillation, okay? A 10% saving, so translate into, if all the refiners were to do it, 160,000 barrels a day. It's like finding an oil field, okay? It's a pretty big, pretty big magnitude. And, uh, 300, and a typical refinery is 300,000 barrels a day. And it, it could, in a year, it could save 220,000 barrels a year, which is 10 to $20 million a year savings, okay? With just simply replumbing, replumbing the thing. What's the model of the story? The model of the story is, in nutshell, opportunities exist in energy efficiency improvements, no matter how mature they may look like. Okay. And sometimes we tend to say it is mature because our own imagination doesn't take us down the path of finding the answer. Okay. So, including myself, I, I declare something mature where I can't think of an answer. Okay. So that's, that's a very, so for the young, young students here, just because some elder ones of us who have been around for a while, if you say mature, think, take it as a challenge. Okay. It's for you to decide whether it is really mature or not. Okay. All right. So I'm going to finish the talk by that. In summary, I, I do believe it is the grand challenge of our time. And I would like to remind you, I did not talk about the environment. This whole thing is connected with the environment. Very, very connected together. I don't think the two are independent issues. Okay. I only left it out because it is Princeton. I don't want to address the environmental aspects. Okay. Because there are the people who are here who are truly ex expert in the field. 
and far more than I am, okay? And uh, we must develop alternate energy sources. I discussed with solar, you could replace it with nuclear. Whatever I told you, it could be hydrogen from nuclear, it could be heat from nuclear, it could be whatever, except growing bi biomass which needs solar, okay? And the, the transportation fuel picture is very challenging. We need to look for the interfaces, okay, rather than seeing them as in the isolations, because I think the solutions are when we look at the interfaces. And as I told you, like, we need both short and long-term solutions. So when I initially talked about the solar economy, I pretended there was no fossil fuel. Those are the long-term solutions. Once we identify the solutions, then we say, how do we build the bridge? Okay, building, it is about building bridges between now and the end game. And, uh, and energy efficiency improvements in the, in the meantime is a must, okay, because a large fraction is lost there. And it's a great time to be an engineer. What can I say? Like, you know, I went to Purdue four years ago. I had no clue what I was getting into, okay? I, it has, it's an absolutely fun time to be an engineer, okay? And uh, just like every work else, every work which we do as a professor, it's always the graduate students who have done the work, right? And so I need to tell you who they are. Okay, Nanita Singh, all my bio work which you saw, single graduate student, for the last three years, he has been cranking up all those, all those numbers, okay? She's a Goa, Mahaprasad Kar, Grayson Ford, Solar cell, when I arrived at Purdue, the lab was totally blank. There was not even a beaker in the lab. It was a new building. Jim saw that. Today we have a full functioning lab making solar cells. Credit to these students, okay? They have done super job, okay? The distillation work I showed you, it is Arun Girdar, Vishesh Shah, those two graduate students. They really took on a problem, which is a very tough problem for all this chemical engineering for the last 70, 80 years. We have cracked it, okay? And, and of course, my colleagues, Professor Hugh Hillhaus, young professor, very bright. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to have him as a collaborator for solar cells. Together, we, we have done that work, okay? Credit for solar cell is as much as his as mine, okay? It's totally a joint work. And uh, Professor Nick Dalgas and Professor Fabio Rivero, they are the catalyst person. Now we are embarking on fast hydropyrolysis with hydrodeoxygenation, and that's all catalytic processes, and that's where they come into picture. And the collaboration with them, I hope, will, if I tell you a story in a year or two that I will tell you we have done it, okay? So that's the, that's the, that's the journey we would like to do. Uh, and uh, with that, here's a beautiful view of Purdue, and thanks to all of you for coming and leaving up with the glitch in the computer and so forth, okay? I'm sorry for that. Well, the, the, the economics number I did not present. That's very correct. And it, that doesn't mean that we have not done it. Okay, we, we have done quite a detailed work on the economics. And needless to say that if the solar electricity does not make sense, solar hydrogen does not make sense either, right? And, uh, and that's was, but that doesn't mean that it is something which cannot happen. And, and that's why I presented the solution in the transition. You know, we are not married to the, to the solar hydrogen. We use that to create what I call creating future scenarios, okay, not identifying the pinch points which need to be solved, and I just gave you one example how you go about, one goes about, which is how went I about solving it. And then you, t you sit back and say, okay, so how do I make it economical? Okay. What does it take that I need to do? So I don't, so, the, so if, if I know how to do fast hydropyrolysis and hydrodeoxygenation, I use a natural gas, small tubes today, okay? Then turn around, when the solar hydrogen is available, just switch it. It is the same reactor, it is the same, same process, right? And switch it. So, so you're absolutely right. So we just cannot sit back with just one thing and wait for it to come, okay? And, uh, and there was a sub part of your question which was like, uh, 
if I, were, if, if I were to use hydrogen directly, for example, in a hydrogen fuel cell cars or something of that nature, versus uh, using hydrogen on this backbone, does it compare? Right? That's what, is that was one of the questions indirectly you asked? Uh, if you did, the only answer I tell you is that if you use the H2 car, the, the gasification process, it does not compare favorably. But if you use the, the fast hydropyrolysis followed by hydro deoxygenation, it is very favorable. Okay. And, uh, and there are, again, multiple scenarios which you can generate, and uh, I've not done that. That's a good question. Okay, the don't know the answer, final answer. Okay, but I can tell you how, where we are starting. That I can definitely tell you. Like, uh, since oxygen and sulfur sit in the same column of the periodic table, cobalt moly, okay, uh, and nickel moly. There's a whole slew of you know other iron-based catalysts. Okay, that's what we're going to try initially. Okay, and some novel metal. Okay, you see the petroleum. Petroleum has very little oxygen. Okay, okay, and uh, so there was never a need for, for that. And uh, so it is basically towards hydro desulfurization, okay. But now we got 35% oxygen, okay, and we need to remove. So, so that's a very different problem than, than historically has been faced. And so only time will tell. So, the problem that I see is that anything that can strip oxygen out may deactivate quickly. Unless it is an oxide itself, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, or novel metals or something, and so hopefully it won't. Yeah, it won't. That, that's correct. Yeah. So, 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 so we'll. Yes, Fred. Actually, that's what I was trying to say. If you were to make that amount, if you were to consume the oil, for example, for 8.3 million barrels, which is what I was t talking about, the release of carbon is 0.33 gigatons of carbon a year. And if you use the natural gas along with the biomass, the release of the carbon is only 0.1, 1, 2 gigatons. So actually, you have less carbon release by the process if you use the natural gas and the biomass compared to using petroleum crude directly. No, that was the whole, it's not, that's what I was trying to show you. That it is not, it is, if you use alone, the, the amount you would make is far inferior compared to the synergy if you use the natural gas and the biomass together. That was the, I made that separate comparison on the slide. Because you see, I tell you why it is very simple. It, it's, it's, it's very simple. If I take a natural gas, and if I try to make a liquid from it, I gasify, right? So there's a gasifier efficiency of 75% or so, or so. I get CO and hydrogen in return, and if I take CO and hydrogen and if I try to make a diesel out of it through fischer tross process, when CO and hydrogen reacts, there's a lot of heat which comes out, okay? Like 24% of the heat which is in the final diesel comes out as heat, and this heat comes out at somewhere between around 250 degrees Celsius with a fairly relatively low exergy, okay? And that's the Achilles heat, okay? Of a fish, that's where the inefficiency is, okay? Uh, and we, night, we, by keeping that structure of the biomass, that's where we are gaining. We are not taking it apart, and we are not joining it again. And that's the secret. So any... Oh, yeah, of course. If you use natural gas directly, it's sure. Sure, 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 sure. sure. Yeah. Okay. So if you use natural gas directly, and if you can fly airplanes out of the natural gas, absolutely yes. Okay. I totally agree with you. Short distance, yep. Yeah. Fair, fair. But, but, but again, let me think. If you did that, I, okay, I have not, the calculation which I have not done, Fred, okay, is uh, how much natural gas I would need to drive equivalent of 803 versus the natural gas which is used in conjunction with biomass. I have not done that calculation. So I really do not know the answer to your question. Which side, it may be, may be washed, it may be not. I can't tell you.
Okay, I, I can't tell you. I, what I cannot tell you is that 198 billion cubic meters of natural gas, whether it can drive, has enough energy content to drive that distance. I do not have an answer for that. 